This segment of the Bass Kayak and Beers podcast is sponsored in part by Dark Horse Tackle. Go to darkhorsetackle.com and use promo code BKB5 to save an extra $5 when you build your own box. Douglas Outdoors. Serious rods for serious anglers. Norsk Lithium. The lithium kayak battery you need is just a click away. Go to NorskLithium.com. Catch Outdoors. The official measuring board for all three national trails. Go to CatchOutdoors.com and use promo code BKB5 to save 5% on your next online purchase. All right, what is what is going on, everyone? Hope you're having a great Thursday. I'm excited about today's episode. We got the winner for the Bassmaster Kayak Series Championship, none other than Drew Gregory. To no one's surprise, man has been doing this for a couple of for about a minute now, and he seems to find more success than failure every time he's on the water. So, big congratulations to Drew. Really appreciate it. I know he's been doing podcasts, interviews, uh, recordings, everything he won as he should. That's one of the cool things about the Bassmaster Kayak Series now is with the championship, they're really now, I think since Steve Owen took over, they're really using their media platform uh, to, you know, highlight the kayak anglers. And that's wonderful. That That's great. That's That helps the growth of the sport, and we're really happy about that. Um, but yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, how Drew Gregory was able to, you know, secure this win, what it means for him um, personally, uh, professionally, and also uh, there's a lot of you out there um, that love his style of fishing, and that's always seems to be a hot topic, hot debate. But uh, we'll talk about what it means for the paddle angler, kind of like the uh, the little guy, as Daniel Perry. Uh, said one time when we were talking about this in an episode called is kayak fishing dead um so it'll be interesting to get his feedback on that always as always if you are watching on uh whether whether it's facebook um instagram or uh youtube feel free to put your comments let them, let us know where you're watching or listening from um, we're also going to announce the winners for a giveaway. If you remember, that was supposed to be yesterday, but unfortunately we couldn't get the episode, uh, for yesterday's show aired out on time. So we had to push it back for next week. So we're going to announce the winners for, for our quarterly giveaway. It's going to be a catch, uh, outdoors product. There's going to be a hundred dollar gift card, uh, for Mariner sales. And, uh, it's also going to be a three month subscription for um uh dark horse tackle now it's not going to be uh uh the winners are not going to be picked out of the live show if you remembered if you watched before um it was based on uh leaving uh, a google uh a review on apple podcast if you leave a review uh rated the show and left your uh comments with your name we would pick a winner so we actually ended up picking three winners so it's going to be out of that um steven bell from uh, North Carolina, thank you for joining us, Stephen. If you have any questions for our guests, we'll try to do our best to get them to to get Drew to you know filling the holes and uh, uh, of any questions that you may have. Um, also, U.S. Kayak Fishing Magazine, hello, thank you for joining us today. Same thing. If you have any questions, feel free to put it on the comment section. Um, before we get Drew here, quick shout out to our sponsors, North Lithium. You can check out the link on my bio. Go to North Glycium. If you're looking for lithium batteries, um, then go check them out. Douglas Outdoors. Uh, go to douglasoutdoors.com. Check out the full lineup of LRS X Matrix. And uh, they have a new lineup of rods called the ERA. They are um, inexpensive rods. I think that's under $100 each one. They have uh, six models. So that's going to be coming out, I think, here at the end of March or the beginning of April, if you want to check them out. Dark Horse Tackle, you can use promo code BKB5, save $5 on your first subscription box, or you can save $5 if you build your own box. Don't need to sign up for the subscription to build your own box. And Catch Outdoors, you can also check out the link on our website, save $5 off your purchase 
on catch outdoors. So Frankie Polyphrone, the head honcho of Slay Nation. Woo! Thank you for joining us, Frankie. All right, without further ado, let's bring in Drew Gregory. Drew, again, thank you so much. You've been doing podcasts, you've been doing interviews, you've been doing live shows, yeah. you've been doing YouTube. I really appreciate it, man. You must be super tired. Yeah, no problem, man. I am, uh, man, I'm feeling good. I, I, you know, I didn't have as many today. I had some, just more phone calls and some interviews with some print media and stuff like that. And, and another one that was supposed to happen, we had to push it back to tomorrow. So I'm feeling refreshed, man, ready to rock and roll, tell this story, uh, better than I have on any podcast. And, uh, there you go. And just, it just weave in some new stuff and just take any questions and answers from all you guys watching live tonight. And, uh, I'll say, I'll say this, Justin Hamner, who won the classic, uh, one of my X2 uh, power batteries teammates, right? He said at the, after day one, when I obviously I just won and had my trophy and I'm back in the media room. Uh, you go after you win, you go back to the media center. You got, you get lots of nice food. There's drinks, everything right there. And obviously the media talks to you and there's a backdrop. They do a lot of videos and, and stuff uh, on, but Justin had a line, just, he was leading the Bassmaster classic. Right. And he had a line of media forever. And, and one of the guys, said, man, we know you're tired. We're, we're just a few more, man. Sorry to, to keep you. And he was like, and you know, Justin's kind of Alabama. He's got the accent. And he was just like, Hey, y'all might not want to talk to me tomorrow. I'll stay here all day. If y'all <laughs> want me to talk. So here I am talking all day. Whoever wants to talk, I'm, I'm going to talk about it because I might never win, you know, win again. Uh, it's, it's, I tough doubt that very sport. much. So, and I, <laughs> you know, not fishing as many as I used to kind of spending more time with the family and the kids. I might not, man. So, but I'm, I feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders with getting the big one. Cause uh, I've got, had AOI, so you know, Bassmaster Hobie, it's around here somewhere. It's, uh, so there's only so much space on the screen. So yeah. So, every but, time uh, we it, have you on, and, and, <laughs> It's, it's, it's one stupid. more trophy. It, by it, by yeah. next year, you're just going to have your eyes just picking out, yeah. out of the trophy room. Yeah, it's, just, <laughs> it's, it's silly. I'm trying to catch up with the rest, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, you know, it's not really going to be possible. Like I said, I'm not fishing as many, but I'm just happy to get this one. I mean, I, I think every angler you want to get, yeah. first of all, it's like you just your goal is to get a national win. Once you start getting on that stage, that's all you ever care about. You could kind of probably die happy with just one national win. And once you get one, you're like, man. An AOI would be cool, you know, or another one. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you get that, you know, very blessed and just fortunate to, to get that and then get another one. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't have a national championship, you know, not a, a Bassmaster Hobie or, or KBF. And uh, my, my chances are getting slimmer when I'm not fishing as many and qualifying potentially for some of those. So to get this one, man, I'm telling you, dude, it just feels like seriously a weight has been lifted and, and it feels like my tournament career, which, you know, hasn't, Think about it. I'd been that long, really, about 2019. Uh, I feel kind of content with it. Uh, but don't worry, I'm still going to try just as hard. So, you guys, you're not off the hook just because I uh, have a little bit of weight lifted off. I'm still going to be trying as so hard hungry, as always. hungrier well, than ever. Still hungry, yeah, still hungry. Well, but, you still uh, have the TOC, yeah, I do. And I, I just don't know how many more of those I'll qualify this year. This dude, I was so bummed. Hobie, oh, your schedule, like AJ and I talked about it and we, he was like, okay, we only have two conflicts with the kayak adventure series presented by GoPro that I'm started. Yeah. And one of them was Texas at the beginning. We said, no big deal. That's Georgia and Texas. That's far away. Sholey Palooza for our event. And they're at Wright Patman. And I really wanted to fish Wright Patman. I love the way that lake looks. And so I was like a little bit bummed about it because that's one I would have like gone to. And then I also, the other one that, that conflicts and, and AJ knew it when we talked, he was like, Man, I think you'd really like this river one, but it looks like it's it's right. The tourism can't change their date. We're going there on the Saginaw Bay and River. Oh, nice. So I'm not going to be able to hit that one because of the conflict. And those are the the main two that I was really that kind of eye and then we're going to fit my style. So I don't know, man, how many, if any, I'll be able to hit this year. And last year I got lucky. I fished one Hobie, the new river, and got second. So auto qualified. That, that wasn't lucky. That's pure but, talent, buddy. That's, well, <laughs> we, you know when you saying? get like, when you have that but, trophy room luck. It's not lucky. <laughs> yeah, but when you fish one, you can't even, no matter how, like, even if you were, you know, Tiger Woods, you know, that's... Well, when fish, you won the Hobie... Tiger Woods, what's that? When you won the Hobie BOS, the 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 AOI, you won it on three, right? You only fished three events and you won. Yeah, that's... that's that right. was, like, that was unheard of, like... Yeah, you... and same with Bassmaster. I only fished the minimum. It was it was four that year, but I fished the minimum. But, but anyway, if Tiger Woods just, just did one event, you know, you would... 
the odds would be he would get third place or worse, not second or, or, or whatever. You know what I mean? So I just fished that once. I mean, I got lucky in the sense that I happened to be the top three and got the automatic bid. You know what I mean? I don't think I wouldn't have been surprised if I was in the top 10 or 15 in or on a river event, but getting that high up to get the qualification to the TOC was very fortunate. Um, so I, I want to get, uh, you know, I'd love to get to another TOC. Maybe I can sneak in something this year and somehow get lucky again and auto qualify, but <laughs> who knows, man. Well, we have Just a couple of questions second. for, well, All at right. least one question from USA kayak fishing magazine yeah. says, do you sleep with that trophy? <laughs> How long? Yeah, that's funny. I, you... I definitely put it in a seatbelt on the way home <laughs> <laughs> in the Tacoma next to me. You just Are your daughters up. getting jealous that you, you, you spend more time with the trophy now that yeah, you the do trophies. with them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. The kids are, you know, they, they're, they're, they lifted it. Uh, Theo and Sophia, they were, they were lifting it and it was pretty, they were like, wow, it's heavy. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's heavy. Now my son, his favorite color all of a sudden is, is gold. You know, he goes from different colors, blue. It was pink for a while. Now it's gold. And he says to me, He says, what's up, Zach? He says to me, um, Dad, uh, before I left on this trip, he goes, bring me back. I always bring back a present, right, for my kids. He says, mm. bring me back something gold. And in my head, I'm thinking, it sounds good to me. Gold is the is the color for first place. So in my mind, this is gold. You know what I mean? So, Theo, I got you something gold. Here it is. It might be blue, but it's, it's gold. You know what I mean? In, in terms of <laughs> first, second, third. So anyway – It was it was well, fun. We've had a good time with it. They had a, a sidewalk chalk drawn with a big trophy on the drive. Yeah, I saw that. Like, that cool was cute. And just just that was man, melt your heart. I mean, yeah. I came that, home that and was, I mean, that was my yeah, favorite was, picture of all the pictures you posted. That was really cool. It was cool. And, and the first thing it's funny because to kind of realize like how all the elite guys and everyone's just regular people. I come home and the next morning the first thing I'm doing is cleaning up the playroom and changing diapers, you know, with the kids, because we, my wife was babysitting us, uh, a, a friend's baby and the house was a little bit of a mess and everything. I'd been gone and it's, you know, it's challenging and it was just cleaning up the, the playroom for hours and, and changing diapers and just being dad. And, and it was just, it was just cool to come home and, and all this stuff didn't even like matter. It wasn't even like, you know, it was cool. And by the way, for those on, um, uh on instagram i have to go back and forth to view the comments because they don't come up in our live stream but I, we, quick caller says i told you you can retire now yeah you probably could uh, yeah. uh yeah. valen vantine's adventure says yo yo what up champ goat whisper i'm assuming i'm the ghost whisper and the goat i was saying I, i guess so i'll take that if you um, share my uh, zach's got that yeah he's got that question up there zach i'm gonna tell you right now let me see here I've got – I'm going to pull up some pictures. I'm going to try to here. By the I question, while in. you do that, we got a yeah. question from um, – I keep coming Metal Jones. It's Sack from Dark Horse Sack. Yeah, yeah. Drew, is it true that that hat you wore during practice brought you a little extra luck you needed to smash that competition? I'm assuming yeah. there's – That what is what I want to show. So, so if oh, you can, you I will click on share my screen. I'll show you the hat he's talking about. Um. I don't know uh, right where. here. I'm starting right here. There you go. Share my oh, screen real quick. And I'll, uh, I'll put up these, these That's pictures. That's a lot right of stuff. Here. There we go. There you go. You see these pictures here? Yeah, it's a lot going on. So there we go. You can zoom in. You can see the dark horse tackle hat. He, you know, I showed it, shared it with him. I said, Hey man, your hat, I wore it in pre-fishing, smashing good fish with it. And, uh, brought me good luck. So. Zach will do anything for free promo. That's why we yeah. love him. <laughs> well, that yeah, exactly right. He's great. Nah, those guys are the best. Uh, shout out, shout out today. to Josh and Sack. They're great, great, great dudes. Yeah, so anyway, those those are some pre-fishing pictures there. So, all right, you can stop sharing the screen if you want. I'm all right, let's that. let's get into the meat and potatoes yeah. of uh, uh, of your tournament. Uh, let's start with um, um, you know how the pre pre fishing go for your practice days you know what yeah. was it what you hoped for or did you struggle on uh practice days sure so we just saw the pictures those are all yeah. from practice all those pictures oh, really? and cool. uh yep that, that's that's what he's kind of saying the, the hat in practice got you know brought me the good luck so i got there on saturday midday ish i guess or or yeah or you know late morning and we had basically i just went to my primary area which i'd already knew was going to be the river 
the only thing that fit my style in that whole lake. You know, you can't go hide in cypress trees or fine grass and vegetation and backwater sloughs. And there's not any other creeks or rivers that have enough water to go up. That was it for me. That's all I had. You know, it was all or nothing. All my chips were in on that. And I, so I went there first on Saturday and uh, I'd been keeping track of the river gauges or the USGS gauges. Like if it was close to the median level, it was actually under the median. We had some rain temperature. There's one gauge way upstream, like four or five gauges upstream that had the temperature. So I could see it hit like 63, like four or five days before we got there. But uh, eventually went back down to the mid fifties because some, some cold nights we had, but I went to the river first because I wanted to kind of see what I had there. And uh, sure enough, I caught those fish. We just saw the pictures from pre-fishing. Yep. That was actually two separate days, but the one with the dark horse tackle hat and that uh, whatever that, that light green shirt, or whatever it was, aqua, that was the very first half day of fishing. So from a strategy standpoint, I'm a little, you know, I think people know that obviously I've had some success, so I don't particularly like to be seen if I can help it. Yeah. Um, because people will just assume I'm naturally just on fish and then they start talking and, and I don't know if it makes any difference at all, but you know, as I've said on other shows, I mean, even the elites, it, you know, they don't want to be seen on their juice. No one wants to be seen. Uh, you guys, other kayak anglers, they don't want to be seen on the point where they're scoping them and they're yeah. there. And then someone else is like, Oh, that's, that's, uh, Eric Siddiqui, man, he's a hammer. Wonder why he was over there. And then when he leaves, they go over there and scan, you know, so yeah. you don't want to be seen. So I actually went to the launch and it's a big public access area, the horseshoe bend. And I actually drove to the left, which is upstream down a dirt road, kicked the Tacoma and four wheel drive, went through some mud holes and some tight spots. And I launched as far as that public access area as possible. Cause it also got me further upstream. My whole plan was to go way upstream further than most people were going to be able to practice, you know? And uh, I knew that that first couple miles for sure was going to get a lot of pressure in, in pre-fishing. So I didn't, I didn't want to find fish there because it, it didn't matter to me because I figured people would be fishing that area in the tournament and that's mm. just wasn't going to be winning fish on a river. That's that size. It's not that big of a river. So if you got people beating it up in pre-fishing and fishing at the tournament and you need two days of fish out of it. Yeah. You're not winning at a spot like that. I already knew that. So I went further up and, uh, fish there and, and, uh, actually some of those fish were caught a little closer to the ramp on my way back down, but either way it proved to me that big fish were in the river. And then I went back to the Airbnb, which is just five minutes right down the road. And, um, yeah, we had a, a real good spot real close to that horseshoe bin, um, which was good and bad thing. Cause everyone during pre-fishing had to pass that Airbnb. So I had to watch all these people, all these hammers and kayak fishing, man, just go down to that ramp during, you know, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and just practice there knowing that, you know, just, I hope they don't find what I found and, and how to do it. But what I did Armando was once I figured out the fish were there, on that half day, the next day I went to the lake uh, on another, the next ramp down on the, the upper end of the lake. And I just started tweaking that torpedo and getting it to go as fast as I could get it to go and draft as shallow as I could get it to draft and still chew the full amount of the full suction of water where it's not cavitating and I could get full speed, but in shallow water. And I think I can run full speed in like seven or eight inches of water. I feel like maybe maybe it was clear. Maybe it's a little bit more than that, but it's probably somewhere around seven or eight inches of water. I can get it. Once you get it churning and, you know, get that full suction, yeah. it, it just kind of flows the water naturally into itself. And you can go shout pretty darn shallow. If you, if you rig it correctly, uh, trim the, the prop up and get the right pitch on the angle yeah. on it. And I was hitting, I used to hit uh 6.2 in my Crescent kayak Sholey. And wow. now I hit 6.7. I got up to 6.7 after some, some like NASCAR crew, crew chief engineer type, whatever I did on that day. <laughs> um, and it was cool. Um, there was a guy there that, um, I'll share the, the clip too. Um, there was a guy there, uh, one of the other competitors, man, what's his name? Corey, I think was his name. Uh, Rasmus. is that Vi? No, it wasn't something like Vi or whatever, but he was so nice. His dad was there. Uh, it dropped him off and he was so nice and that he, um, video videoed me out there and I'll pull the video up and you can to put it in right now if you want. It's in the queue right there. So that's me going 6.7. That's when I hit 6.7. I was like, hey, man, I'm going 6.7 in this thing now. I just had to adjust the weight properly. And I put everything I was going to use in the tournament day in the kayak. So I wasn't testing it without the weight. You know what I mean? I was testing it with what I wanted to have. So I was going 6.7. And then um, that's I, I knew that, that was impressive. That was actually, uh, yeah, thanks. It, it, I thought it was very impressive that 
I was able to get that much more out of it, especially when Jeff little rig mine to begin with, but he didn't, you know, he didn't adjust every little fine. You know what I mean? It's like, how much time does he have to, to do that for people? So, um, but the guys at Westbrook supply company in Atlanta with Jeff rigged it up and, and set it up and it was awesome. And it's all, it's been a great setup. And 6.7 is key though, because going up this river, just to kind of lay, lay the land here for everyone watching or listening, the river doesn't have like your normal rapids. It's just these narrow choke points, narrow like this way, but not even so much this way, more just like this way. It just gets shallow and rolls over these pebbly sections. And it's, it's just steep gradient. It's just like that for 30, 40, 50 yards, 75 yards. It's just nonstop. Just it's on a downhill slope, kind of like a, Streets of San Francisco, if they were flooded, just psh, Pittsburgh's probably better analogy around there. Pittsburgh's pretty hilly and steep, but um, it's just the, the water's just rolling. So you need some speed to get up that stuff. You need, you got to have speed. And then I was able to um, just rig that kayak set up to get to the fish that I want to catch. But in the second day of practice and third day, um, I went further up the river at some other access points that weren't part of our legal launching for the event. But I went up there just because I wanted to learn how to catch the fish in the river. And at one point I was as far as 13 miles up, just practicing catching fish in the river, but not, you know, that I would get up there. I could with the amount of batteries and, and whatnot or time. It was more, I just wanted to learn how to catch the fish in that river without burning any of my fish. Cause I knew that, you know, if I can catch fish 13 miles up and I can catch fish two and three miles up from our ramp. Right. And then obviously another 10 miles up the river, there's, there's good fish in between. So I ended up um, catching fish up there and figuring out how to catch them. And then I floated back down to, I think I went up three and a half miles that very first day of practice. So I floated back down to that exact same point so that I could turn my kayak around, go back up and ensure that I could go up and stay legal all the way. So, and I figured out I, I could, it wasn't easy. You got to have good whitewater kayaking skills and good form on your paddle stroke, which I can't do right now because I got these uh, trophies trophies. Here, but, but, uh, but anyway good good form with your core you got to work with your core and thanks to the aca cert certification course i took in november with with uh dustin hoy and russ snyders and jeff little and wade from yak attack and everybody there we were just taught even errors that i had in paddling and i thought you know i'm a good paddler i worked with the jackson kayak crew for how many yeah. years and i and i am a good paddler but i still was doing world class incredibly. paddler yeah thanks i mean yeah those are the best and but i still was doing things wrong so if i don't have the torpedo on high with the setup i have with that innovative sportsman rock guard that it's able to make that thing bounce up and not you know bust a prop or sheer pin then i don't you know you know if i don't understand how to read currents and read water to be able to maneuver my torpedo like my you know my mm -hmm. boat up there along with those paddling i don't get to the, my fish and i didn't catch a ton of fish up there really far actually but it didn't matter. I just needed to catch a few good ones. And I just, I caught a few good ones and uh, a 19 and a half small mouth on day one and a 21 and a quarter on small mouth on day two, a 16, three quarters on day two. I got some good fish up there, but most of my fish definitely came from, you know, just a few miles away from the, from the, the launch point. It wasn't too far away, but uh, yeah, it was fun, man. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about day one or, or just kind of yeah, before we do that, day. I yeah. wanted to kind of like go over the comments. And again, for those on, uh, uh, what do you call it on, uh, Instagram live, I try to get, um, as much as I can, um, uh, because it's yeah, not, it's doesn't share, so I have to go back and forth, but, uh, tackle yeah. box breakdown says, congratulations. Um, also, uh, we have a question guys, from, uh, USA kayak fishing magazine. What mm -hmm. amp battery do you use? I'm assuming well, for trolling. Well, for Torquedo, they have a, yeah. their proprietary battery that comes with it. You can't, you, I can't use my X2 batteries. Uh, those are more used in my Tacoma and power oh, okay. my Go, GoPros and, 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 and graphs whenever I use them, but I just don't really use them <laughs> very often. So not really on that, but that's more what the X2s are for. But the proprietary battery that, that Torquedo has is what I use, but that's a good part of the story. Uh, USA kayak fish and mag. That's a good part of the story because I had to borrow a lot of uh, batteries because I knew this was my strategy from day one. And I knew to get away from other people, I had to have more batteries um, because the torpedoes are proprietary, but other people could have had like two 100 amp hour, you know, like X twos or whatever, you know, you guys are Norse, you guys are sponsored by Norsk. Okay. So you could have yep. had two giant one of those. And then I had to, you know, carry four or five, you know, so and just switch them out during the day and manage the, 
the the throttle and and, and my range and all the the data that the uh, torpedo you know uh, gives you on your throttle there i had to kind of keep an eye on all that stuff so i mean it was it was tricky but borrowing those batteries from all the folks uh and i had seven total batteries i just wasn't met playing around because sometimes i've been in tournaments before because the torpedo batteries charge slowly so i've been mm -hmm. in tournaments where you're 30 minutes or an hour away from the ramp when the tournament ends and then you get back and it takes you a long time to load you got a 45 minute or hour drive back to the house you finally get around to plugging them up and charging them first thing usually and you and they still don't get a full charge by the time you gotta wait if you gotta wake up early because again your airbnb is an hour away or 45 minutes yeah. away you don't get a full charge so i had extras just to be sure so i, I borrowed it from dustin hoy from billy chambers from Ryan Parker from Jonathan from Eco Fishing Shop. I can't thank those guys enough for letting me just borrow those batteries. And uh, Zach Van Landingham, one of my good buddies, who actually let me borrow an entire second Torquedo as well that I'd sold him, but you know he hadn't even used it yet. And I said, "Hey, man, I'm sorry, but uh, I don't think I get my new Torquedo until May, the new one that they came out with." Yeah. So you mind if I just take that one back just for this trip, just in case I need it? I'm probably not going to use it. Turned out that I needed it <laughs> for yeah. the story. I need I needed to rig that up for day two. Um, so so how many, if I don't have all that stuff, I don't win. When when you needed batteries, now how many batteries were you in your kayak while you were on the water on tournament day? Like yeah, you like, got four just for the trolling motor. One day was like four. One day was five. In your kayak inside yeah, your kayak. Yeah, yeah, they're light. They're thirteen pounds. They're small. They're like Dang. two of them. So two. I'm actually just got done doing a walkthrough of my kayak setup. Um, and people have been asking about that, you know, so I did a whole walkthrough. I set it up on stands. I'll put it on my YouTube channel. You guys can see it, but in the front hatch of the Crescent Shola, you can fit two Torquedo batteries in the cubby. There's a little fish finder cubby I designed in that boat. You can fit one there. One fits right there. And that's great. Cause three of those are up front with the weight, you know, needed to, to level you out yeah. and get you, you know, more weight forward. And plus I moved my seat for about six six seven inches forward as well in that boat so it wasn't in the little grooves and stuff where it's supposed to go i'm more forward even with my body weight i got one behind me that's being used right with the torpedo uh being used and then i could and i could put another one behind me as well or under my seat there was still space under my seat they actually fit under the seat uh as well in the high position so uh and you could have put more i mean but you know they again it adds up to just no different than someone's just got two batteries on their kayak if they're 100 or 125 amp hour you know yeah i just uh had to do it a different way and it cost me a little bit of time having to stop and un unscrew it. It was worth it. Put it back <laughs> on. Yeah, it was worth it. It worked out for sure. And having the, the speed and range data on those things, I mean, you can't beat that. You know exactly what you got to do and yeah. what you shouldn't do because it's right there in front of you and you see it. So it's pretty cool. Uh, another question from USA Kayak Fishing Magazine. Were you pushing the weight limit of your kayak? No, I was not. The, the Sholey has a 450 pound weight capacity. I'm only like 170. and I didn't bring any tackle. I, I lightened the whole thing up, you know, pre-fishing. Uh, if you may remember seeing one of those pictures, I had a black pack yeah. on there. Didn't even bring a black pack. I didn't, I just had two Plano boxes and those batteries and about four rods. I may have taken five, uh, four or five rods. I mean, a little, I, you always need to take a bag of tools uh, to everything you need for that torpedo to fix it, which yeah. I had to do. I had to fix the rock guard, um, had to adjust you know, if you ever need to adjust the, the prop nut or anything happens, the extra shear pin, all that is, is in a tool kit, you know, with pliers and everything. And that weighs a little bit WD 40. I mean, that kind of, that does have some weight to it. So yeah. you got to bring that unfortunately, uh, but you got to, and, uh, and, and the hopefully batteries. not needed. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. And then, uh, bring a little water and food, of course, enough water and food. And, uh, I have a little teeny bag that's got, uh, some extra GoPro batteries and, and stuff for the GoPros and some ibuprofen, this little stuff doesn't weigh much. And that's, and that's about it, man. I mean, I lighten it up, but those, again, those batteries alone, if you, if you add five times 13, I don't know how much, but whatever that is, that's at least like 60 don't something pounds probably. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, it's gotta be more than that, right? Six, 70 like pounds, maybe 20. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for 26, 26, uh, oh my God. Uh, so 32. I'm, uh, 32 plus, uh, what am I, uh, how much did you say? 30 I mean, five times 10 is 50. 40, so yeah. It's about 50. Another, so five times 50. So I'm sure. And then if you had take the three, I probably did horrible times, math there. <laughs> three times, so it's probably like 65 pounds. I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Take. Don't, I was told there would be no math and you were too. So we're off the hook. Someone, <laughs> in, the, someone in the comments help us out, but either way, it's about 65 pounds. And then 
I'm 170. I mean, the weight capacity is 450, like I said. So we're we're not we're not even touching that weight capacity. And the fact that I could get 6.7 tells you that we are good to go on the weight capacity. Can still run. That's just because that kayak was made with a, a good amount of volume for. Um, you know, anglers that are, I designed it, not just for, I didn't design it for Drew Gregory. You know, that's the thing when you, you design a kayak, you, you can't design one if you're my size for me, you know, you, you know, used to be a little lighter, 150, 160, and kind of pushed to 170 now with the dad bod. But either way, that's not, most people are probably, you know, I'm five, eight, most people are probably bigger than I am. So we designed that boat to hit that mid range. Most of the yeah. people, even guys in the over 300 pounds of fish it and are stable on it. They love it. As long as you have good paddling skills and, and good sea legs, you know what I mean? If you will, on the water, you, you know how, you know, understand how to paddle and how kayaks feel because you've been in it before. You can be in that kayak, no problem, especially that weight capacity. Shout out to uh, Richie Yak Angler on Instagram. Says congrats to what's up, Armando. Thank you, guys. Hope all is well. Hope all is well for you too, Richie. Thanks for joining us through Instagram. Yeah. All right, let's talk about the um, – let's talk about uh, day one and day two. We don't need to break it down too much. You know, what was, you know, day one, what you found, you know, did you yeah, have to, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of go plan A, plan B, plan C, and uh, how it sure. all came about? So here's what's interesting, guys, and this is a, a cool tip. I haven't really shared this uh, on any of the podcasts yet. You, you what you want to do is work backwards, like typically. So I knew where I wanted to be at the end of the day, and I knew how long it took to fish that spot. There was a spot at the end of the day that would take me about 30 minutes to fish. I needed 30 minutes up there, right? So I knew I needed to be there at 2.30 at the very latest, 2.30, that last spot way upstream. So you start working backwards. Then you know how fast your kayak goes, right? And upstream, you get three, average about three miles an hour instead of your typical 6.7, maybe three and a half if you're lucky. And so uh, I, you, you know how many miles up that is, right? From the previous place that you want to fish. And then you know how long that that typically would take to fish approximately how much area that is and how much to cover. So you kind of can give yourself back off another 30 minutes or however long you need to fish that section. You just keep doing the math and you start to figure out a game plan on, and you can literally set up a timeline for tournament fishing for your day of, I need to be here by this time. And then I need to be leaving by this time. And you can set alarms if you want to get your know, real, like, you know, serious about it. I don't really do that. I just kind of keep up and in, in my head and, and look at the phone every once in a while. But, but, um, it, but anyway, that's what I did. I, I started in a slough that has more largemouth. So the big, so the backwaters and the sloughs, the murkier waters, the calmer waters, the largemouth like that, the small mouths were in the clear water in the main river, um, a little bit more current related, obviously. So yeah, I started with the largemouth fish because that water is a little warmer. Um, and, we had some cold nights, right? So I figured let's let the, the clear water takes longer to, to warm and, and it, you know, cools down quick as well. So I wanted to let that hopefully heat up as much as possible for the afternoon bite. Cause it was, you know, probably low fifties that morning of the first day of the tournament or mid fifties at the best, uh, in that slew. And so I just throw in, uh, you know, caught some, you saw those pictures where I caught some, right. Yep. On that, uh, spinner bait or yeah. And uh, so what, what I did is I fished that same, I only caught two in this slough in practice. And then I quit fishing, did not want to fish any more of it. I said, Whoa, I caught like a 17 something and a 19 and a half. And I was like, Oh, okay. Stop, 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 stop. I don't want to catch any more fish. It's Saturday. So thank God I got plenty of time for those fish to just totally reset. I went back there and threw um, instead of the spinner bait, cause I caught them on that, you know, in some of those spots I caught fish on, I threw the jig, the, the cross size power finesse jig from Z-Man because I wanted to give the fish a different look, you know, uh, even though it was, you know, four days ago, I, I still, I mean, I know they're there and a jig is what even more realistic than a spinner bait. So why not just throw the jig and crawl? And, uh, they, they hammered it, um, caught a 16, caught a 19 and three quarters. And I have a feeling, I still haven't gone back and looked that that 19 and three quarters was the exact 19 and a half I caught in practice, but I just didn't in practice. You're not trying to pinch the tail to get every last quarter yeah. inch out of it. You're just seeing how long they are. And I, and it came on the exact same spot and it's, it's pretty cool that it could have been the same fish, but, um, and I went around that entire slew and then I started throwing the spinner bait to the areas that hadn't seen the spinner bait in practice. So I caught everything over 16 inches, caught a 17 and three quarters, probably had like high eighties. Uh, when I left that slew had five fish and they were all good. Everything was over 16 high, maybe like 87 inches or something, 86, mm -hmm. 87. And then, uh, started work, working my way upstream. 
uh, towards the smallmouth stuff and, and, you know, not really doing a lot of fishing because there was a lot of dead water and swift water and just places that weren't holding bass, at least not this time of year holding bass, but they'll hold them later in the year. And when the water levels continue to fall and the water temps go up, they'll spread out. They were still more in their wintering holes, right? So um, I ended up going way upstream, man, way up and found uh, there was only 30 minutes left in the event. And there was a spot that I'd found some fish in practice way up there. And I'd seen them because the water was clear. I looked down, I saw some big smallmouth. And uh, because it was bluebird sky day, sunny, I ended up putting that Z-Man Gobius on. And I can pull up the the pick the video of the um of the fight if you want that one. Yep. Um, it's right here. And uh, do as I say, not as I do, guys, because I did not fight this fish. I mean, I, I, I did fine. Don't get me wrong, but I should have used my net. You can pull it up. But uh, so this is around 2.30, a little bit before 2.30. And I hook up with that Z-Man Gobius. Just kind of, it looks like a river darter. You know, have you ever seen the river darter fish that yeah. are in the bottom? That Gobius looks Ow. just like it. So. That, was a tor that was a torpedo just coming straight at you. Yeah, it was. So I start loosening up the drag. And it's open deep water here. You can see this is kind of one of those calmer Stop. sections that they, they were Stop. kind of living in um, and pre-fishing. And they moved on me on day two uh, for sure. But... They were in, like in these kind of slower, deeper pools, but there weren't many like this at all. It was mostly moving and s swift and shallow. But uh, I just turned on that front oh, GoPro, so I got the angle. But I can fast forward this fight. It's kind of long. But um, she's about to go to a log right here. And uh, you'll notice, I mean, I'll put my hand on that spool a lot if I want to, like, prevent her. Straight braid, 8-pound test, straight braid. But I'll put my uh, hand on the spool a lot when I see a fish no leader? trying to, like, no leader. I just went straight braid. It's just eight pound. It's so thin. They just, I just don't feel like they see it. Yeah. And um, even that clear water. I mean, obviously they, they were biting it in practice, so I just kept it the same. See, I'm holding that spool because I don't, I don't want that fish to go into that log. And if I wanted to let him run again, then I just let my hand off the spool. You know what I mean? You can just do that. But the thing that I really messed up on, I didn't do a good job, and I know a lot of elites have laughed at themselves sometimes with landing fish um because i don't stick. use a net like they don't no, you know the, no, no, i just no. don't like to use a net I and i, I should have i have one behind me right now i should have grabbed it because i typically catch all my fish on bait casters with big single hooks you know i don't need a 30 pound braid i just don't need a net they just get boat flipped in or i grab them with my hand i should have grabbed my net but not only should i have grabbed my net i should not have grabbed the line i freak out because you can see right here there's a log under the water right there you can barely see it big log she was going under it and I started freaking out and just grabbing the line. Big no-no. Should never do that. Yeah, I was and, about uh, to say, a veteran like you I, grabbing the line? I just freaked oh, out, man. Oh, I just my God. Out. The gobies just fell out. So oh the gobies just fell out. So watch that again. The bait falls out of its mouth right when. And that's probably because I was giving yeah, that slack you, and letting her shake that, that bait around. Oh, my God. The gobies just fell out. And you can see that <laughs> the bait just fell out. Thank you, God. That's the best and, uh, sound bite. The goby fell out. <laughs> Yeah, and there I am. I go over towards the bank to to uh, score it. Kind of stupid dad joke. So half on the go. Anyway, um, and this is it's kind of funny here. I'll get a video with this all eventually. Nineteen. That is a monster. Let's go, Bias. Let's go. Stupid dad joke. That is funny. That was a stupid dad joke, like I said. But I also did say I'm a dad, so I can say that. So then just hop out there and uh, let her. Some hey, if you win and... that, you get you win the Skag, Bass Bass yeah, Skag Series Championship. Yeah, you can, can say whatever you want, there buddy. You, there you go, yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Then, uh, yeah, just want to let her re refresh for a second, let her get some some uh, some air, and she swam off and healthy and happy. And I was healthy and happy at that point because that was the end of the day, and I cold up, so that was cool. That was your uh, last one? Last one of day one. That got me to 90. Like I said, I probably left here like 87 inches out of that slough, and took me all day until I could catch another fish that had any significance. And it was that one exactly where I'd saw them in practice and found them at way up there and, and do that spinning rod and just slow rolled it and, uh, on the bottom and she hammered it. So it's pretty cool. Um, thank you guys for all the comments. Thank you, Stacy. Appreciate also it, comments on Instagram from uh super new F 71 evening guys watching from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. That's awesome. Thank you that so much. Awesome. Super. New F seventy one. I hope I see. Man, that. Ottawa's got some. There's some great, great fishing up there. Yes, some uh, great anglers over there too. Yes, for sure. The um, so then yeah, day two is let's, pretty cool. I got day two. I got yeah, let's go to good day two. video. I got some videos to share there too. So before I get to 
like before I leave day one, I do want to say that that it was nerve wracking for so many reasons. Someone in the comments said that's when you know you're living right. Okay. And I've had a lot of moments where fish came off on like last year on spinnerbait, two giants, and I probably would have beat Russ at the championship. Uh, him and I were sharing water and I ended up with four fish because uh, I only had six bites that day and I lost two giants on a spinnerbait of all things. You know, whatever, should have, would have, could have, you know, you're, you just, that's just tournament fishing. You know, you sometimes you're lit, you know, you make these comments, that's how you're living right in it, but the opposite happens all the time too. And, no. and so you need these breaks typically to win. Uh, I, I never should have even let that happen. It should have just grabbed the net, but anyway, the, um, but he's right. There's a lot of things that, that happened that were just, I mean, call it whatever you want to call it, man. But it was just like magical. It was uh, miraculous, whatever. But one of them was in the middle of that day on my run up the river. There's some, like I said, some tough stuff to get up. It's challenging. It's you, you got to burn some energy, sweat for sure. And uh, my motor just gave me an error code at one point. And I'm like, what in the world is this error code? And I switch batteries, turn it off and on. You know, the typical stuff you do, your computer's mm -hmm. not working, turn it off and on. Phone's not working, turn it back on. I turned it off, turned it on. I switch batteries. And then all of a sudden, man, I, it would, wouldn't work. I had 20, probably 20 or 30 minutes was just me messing around trying to get it to work. And otherwise I'm dead in the water. I can't go further upstream, right? Well, for some crazy reason, it just started working. I mean, I just said some prayers and I was like, you know, please God, basically like, it just worked, man. It started working and never cut off again the rest of the whole day. Never that, cut off. That's kind of so, deja vu because that happened to you. Was it on a it TLC did. or the, or the Bassmaster? KBF, KBF one time, national championship. I had a motor, motor blow up on me. and uh, But that was, again, usually it's you know user error, my fault. And that one probably was because it was a motor guide and I shortened the shaft. Oh. And I guess my screw that, that went back through the head had nicked the wires. Now, I don't know why in the world it, it you know had to happen at the – KBFNC when I'd had 95 inches uh, after KBFNC, day one. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, but because I use it all year and it didn't, you know, have any problems. But all of a sudden it's it was a white one, the saltwater one. And at night yeah. I was going up the uh up up the lake and it started glowing like red and you know, orange and uh just and then it just smoked and I was like, oh great. And I had to paddle a solo skiff all day long and went from 95 inches to only be able to catch 79 because I couldn't get up to my fish. But I came back the next day and ended up taking that little crescent ultralight to Caddo and just paddling and not even using a motor and catching a 90 something and still cast a check. But it was, it's true. That did happen another time. So that's why I'm saying oh, everything's got to fall into place. And when you got motors involved and moving parts, everything like that, yeah. it's just, you got the more go. moving parts, the more they can go wrong. Yeah. More can go wrong. Yeah. So that was one big thing that happened. That was just a blessing for sure from God that he, that, that started working again. And I made it up the whole way. Now, the other thing I forgot to mention that only, one other person launched at that ramp with me. So all these people on pre-fishing that I'm like so nervous about, and even Steve Owens said to me, uh, at Thursday night's meet and greet, or maybe it was Friday's check-in. He was like, dude, are you okay? You don't seem yourself. And even, uh, one of my best friends at the house, Jake Hepner said the same thing to me at one point. He's like, dude, you seem, you don't seem like yourself. Are you okay? And I wasn't okay because I had caught 95 in, or 92 inches in like, half a day. And I knew, you know what I mean? Like what I was doing, I knew I was on fish to win this thing. And it's always been a dream to win it. And then watching all those people pass every day and fish that, you know, really good, you know, your Matt balls, Jody Queens, Russ Snyder's John Dalton, who stayed at the house, Brian Slayton, all guys that love the rivers, Jake. Oh man. He's a good angler for the river too. They all were fishing it. So I was nervous, man. I was like, not myself uh, for sure. I was stressed and, and had a lot of anxiety about it. But anyway, that Steve Baker was the only one that got there. Another, he stayed with, with us as well. An incredible hammer from, from uh, Ohio that you guys are probably going to hear more from yeah. in the future. But, uh, you know, he was kind of fishing behind me. Didn't work out for him, but he had a setup and he was on the right thing, you know, in that river that there was definitely fish to win it, obviously. And he got all the way up with me, you know, a long ways up there, like six or seven miles before he had to turn around. And his, you know, he did it right. I mean, his motor setup, he pays attention to Jeff Little's videos. He rigs them up right. He's super smart guy and good angler and he was up there with me doing all the right stuff and that just goes to show you that that it's not some magical thing all of a sudden i just get up further than anybody else and just fish or just no. jumping in the boat i'm like oh god this is so easy it's not i mean there's jet boats fishing it and pre-fishing there's there's drift boats fishing it guiding clients that place gets hammered and the water is crystal clear and bass are smart and they uh you know tough to catch so 
Just because you're fishing like Drew Gregory doesn't mean you're gonna catch him like Drew Gregory. Yeah, (laughs) I mean, yeah, I mean, (laughs) I mean, it's like look at how how many people were there. Who was at the ramp besides me and Steve? Nobody. And they all pre, I mean, not all, but like a lot of the field pre-fished the river. They weren't there because of whatever reason. They found something better on the lake. Maybe they the weather was bad those days. I know when I talked to Russ, we kind of surmised. I told him, I said, "Here's what I think happened. You guys didn't catch them because the weather was not good." To, for fishing on Sunday and Monday. And I think no matter where you went those days, it probably wasn't the greatest days because it was post front, the coldest yeah. it got windy. I don't, I didn't even do that great further up the river when I was just trying to see how to catch them in the river. I just knew they were in there cause I caught them on Saturday and I knew that, that I could figure it out, you know? So they, they all tried it or a lot of people obviously tried it, weren't there. So just cause you, get up the river and in practice you could do whatever you want if you wanted to wade and portage and get out and not exert the energy to get up there thinking that you might exert the energy if if you catch them further up there and they tried it and, and i guess just didn't find whatever i was able to find so uh but day two day two let's go all right well real quick any questions before we go to day no. two um uh on instagram super new f71 drew question what was your color of choice I'm assuming spinnerbait or anything, regardless. Sure, what yeah, yeah. The, um, so it's a really interesting tournament because I'm fishing some very, very stained water in the slough, and then right next to it is, and it's stained because beavers are back there. There's a beaver dam way back there, and beavers mm. are always making commotion, swimming around. Yeah. It stays very stained. So it's your typical muddy Oklahoma water, which is crazy because then it, where the slough comes and it meets the main river, it's crystal clear. That water flowing mm. by is just 10 foot visibility. So I'm rigged up for multiple things. So when I'm in the stained water, I've got a spinner bait. That's uh, like a, a, a white and chartreuse Z man sling blades mm-hmm. with a glow chartreuse tail, which is basically a white and chartreuse tail minnows. And I put a second skirt on it before I put that trailer on like a second skirt to bulk it up and uh, just allow more water displacement to go around that bait. So the fish can just feel and hone in on it better. Uh, I love two skirts whenever I'm fishing muddy water. And then the belt, the blade is also painted chartreuse, which matches that tail and matches the skirt, you know, and uh, it's a wide willow leaf blade. I switch it out to, it's a wide willow. That's uh, it's like a chartreuse. So basically it's the color of this X2, you know, shirt right here. I mean, really. And uh, that just shows up really good in muddy water. So that was the muddy water. When I go to clear water, I maybe didn't have the second skirt on and I, and I would do a little bit more of a natural, you know, and, and then just your regular blades that had the flash instead of the painted ones. And then the, I had a jig and crawl was doing really good. Just a dark, just a green pumpkin, uh, Z-Man cross size power finesse jig with the pro crawls trailer, uh, the bigger crawl, not the TRD crawls, the pro crawls, but you got to cut about a half inch of that pro calls crawls off. Otherwise it won't fit very well in that compact little finesse jig, you know? So it's mm-hmm. a power finesse jig. So it's still a very stout hook and you can boat flip fish in. But I just like how small and compact it is. And I was throwing it on a quarter ounce because when you put that bigger Z-Man Elastec on it, it actually helps it float more. So a quarter ounce fish is more like a an eighth of an ounce, quite frankly. It just buoyances yeah. it, buoyances it back up. But but what's cool is when the water temps are low and it's the early spring or late winter, you want I, I like a lighter weight jig because you want that thing to fall slower. And, and when you're on the bottom finally moving it, you're just kind of like it just lets it kind of float along and drift along yeah. more in a slow, natural, like a, you know, the metabolisms, the fish aren't quite up to where they're super aggressive. So I don't want that bait a half ounce or three eighths, just plummeting down fast. It doesn't look normal and natural. And it's just doom, down to the bottom. So that's kind of why I was using that. Uh, and that was the color green pumpkin on the, the trailer. And then uh, I had a chatterbait that uh, we'll show a video here. My first fish on day two was in break a project Z chatterbait and breaking brim with a chatter spike and green pumpkin. So it just looks like a bluegill. And then, um, yeah, the, the gobius was in natural. It was a half ounce gobius and natural color. And, and then, then the, Zach here. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Zach has yeah, a Zach question. What kind of stick, what kind of stick do you have on your GoPro? I mean the GoPro, you, you can, I'll post these pictures, but when you go look at the pictures, all it is is the boondocks landing gear mm. and it's put in the, the, where the boondocks landing gear goes. And basically, uh, it's just where the, if your wheels would be flipped up straight up tall, that's all it is. I put it in that orientation where it's up and then I put a, uh, oh, like so a, just the a, wheels, yak attack just... ball. And the wheels oh, okay. not on there. Yeah. The wheels not on there. Just the ball, the yak attack balls up there, but my flag is attached to that post. It's very sturdy. Actually a little tip. You got to put some, uh, 
you know, some gorilla tape or duct tape or whatever you want on that, you know, that like rectangle part that slides into the, to the landing gear. Yeah. You got to like put some grill tape on there. So it makes it a little tighter. Otherwise it kind of shakes, you know, it's loose. You got to get in there and it's tighter. And then the whole thing is just when your boat moves, the whole post moves. It's not like there's a lot of shake and wobble. It's real sturdy. And then the yak attack uh, components finish, finish the rest and make it kind of a little bit like you noticed that one clip when I was letting that fish go, I just reached behind me and turned it, you know, yeah. with the yak attack ball system and ball and hinge system. I don't forget what that product is called, but either way, angle Stick it down pool? and then, well, well, it's the, not the boom stick. It's not the actual the stick. stick. It's just yeah. the piece that that oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Swivel, the ball and the other component. But anyway, Ram ball? It, you hit. It's, no, that was another brand, right? The Ram brand. ball. Yep. Yeah, that was another brand. This is just the. Oh. It's. I don't know, but you guys know what I'm talking about the two. Yeah. The thing that com, that that joins the two balls. That piece that joins the two balls. Yeah. Someone help us out here. But anyway, you'll put you know what I'm talking comments. about. So, you put it that angle it down. And so it's easy to kind of take and move around and, you know, real easily. My lights on that post, my flag. Um, if I want to use a flag, if I need to, for, so it's a pretty cool little setup. And then a hard wire down to uh, a little battery pack. You can get them at batteries plus stores, um, you know, with your own uh, X2 is owned by batteries plus. And they're, so they're sponsored mine as well. You get those little battery packs, you know, you can get them off Amazon too, whatever, but they're, they're really nice. And you just hardwire uh, your cable, right? spiral it down that post with some zip ties or whatever you want, you know, electrical tape or something. And it makes a really nice, steady, secure GoPro, you know, filming platform. And I always keep it close enough behind me where I can still hit and reach it. And yeah. also use, I typically use super view. I don't know if I did this tournament. I think I did, but typically behind me, I want super view in order to capture the most action and the camera in front, just so you know, this is all like a little GoPro segment here. The camera in front, I don't even run full time. The only one that's running full time is one in the back, which is why every once in a while, if I have a fish on like that Gobius fish that we just showed, I'll just tap the one in front of me. And you can also just say GoPro start recording, but uh, I just, it's just easier for me and more secure knowing I can just tap it. Once I got the fish on and they're hooked good, it, you know, but you don't even have to turn that on during the fight. The only no. time that I've ever in editing cut to that front clip, where it's just the hero shot looking at me is either just landing it. If I happen to hit it, you know, before I landed it or, uh, when I'm just holding it in front and, and just holding it by the camera and just just talking about the fish and the catch, that's really when you'll use that for a still photo. You'll use it to talk about the fish and the catch and to let it go maybe, or you could turn the back camera and angle it down, but really it makes filming simple. And yeah. so hopefully we're going to teach people more about this with the kayak adventure series. Cause that's the whole premise where we go to these theaters for the awards and put the videos on the big screen behind us. And it's not that complicated guys, hardwire a GoPro with a memory card that can last all day and the battery will last all day. And that's it. I mean, the front one, you can just turn it on after you caught the fish already, if you want those good photos. Um, so that's just little, little tips on the film in there. You don't have to go. I mean, if you really even wanted to, to land the fish, if you didn't hit it while you were, were catching it to get the real landing, you could always put it back in and do a fake, just grab, you know what I mean? Yeah. As well. And you got your, you don't have to burn a bunch of data up on that front thing, get it hardwired in, get all that. It's just, no, it's just one GoPro battery in that little camera. And, and that's it for the front one. So, all right, let's go to day two. Day two. Uh, what, yeah, let's go. Well, how? Tell us about day two. Yeah, I will tell you about day two uh, with a video. The first fish I caught was the big bass of the event, and uh, it's a uh, it's queued up it's right like there. Twenty two inch, right? Twenty two inch. I went up the. And there's a little slough. That that right there's the slough. The river's to my right, but everything ahead of me is the backwater. It's, it's all get, it gets muddy further back you go. And I just horsed this fish, you know, 30 pounds, SX1 Sunline. And I had a horse over all those logs. That's the only fish I caught on that Project Z Chatterbait. Yes! That's cool. With the uh, faithful Project Z Chatterbait. Chatter spike. About six and a half pounder. Um, see, I never hit the front camera there, but see, this is the front camera. Now I'm talking about it. I just turned that front camera on for a oh, photo. That's a great way to start tournament. That's like a, a female that hasn't uh, laid their yeah. eggs, right? Right, right, exactly. They're all free spawn. You can see it's, you know, six, six and a half pounds, probably Absolutely ready to spawn. inches. And uh, obviously starting the tournament out like that, I mean, you know you got a shot uh, at this thing. If I can put together, there's the main river coming in back over there on that side. So, I know I have a shot. Once I got that, you know, I knew it could have been the big bass of the tournament. Most likely probably would have been. Uh, I can't remember what day one's big bass was, but I don't even think it was 
21. It was 20, 20 point something probably. Now I'm hitting 22 with my first fish. And, and I know everything I caught in that slew was above 16 the day before. So if I can just get some more, Hey, we, we might be able to pull this off, but man, fishing is tough guys. Every day is different. They change. I caught a 16 in that slew next. And then I went, uh, around some more areas in the slew and I lost three in that whole slew. I got five bites again, just like day one, but three of them did not get the boat. Uh, one of them was on, I fought it for a minute went down in some wood. Next thing you know, it's gone. Um, one of them just swiped at it real close to the boat and, and swirl and missed it. I mean, gone. I let it reset and I went around the slew again with some different baits to try to like pick up one of those fish that I missed or find a new fish. I didn't run past and just nothing. So nervous, very nervous having two fish heading out of there in the clear water. But the only thing that gave me a little bit of optimism and hope was the fact that, uh, it's cloudy today and a little bit windy, a little cloudy, some drizzly drizzle in the forecast potentially. So that helps with that clear water, you know? And yeah. I saw from the day before where some of those big smallmouth were living, I thought, man, the night before, actually, when I was thinking about and looking at the weather forecast, I drove out down the street to Jimmy Houston's outdoors store. He's got right there and uh, picked up uh, a lot of baits. So I was nervous and panicked, picked up a lot of stuff, but I picked up the Zal dangerous swim bait. Um, the new one that, that they came out with, I guess it's bass mafia. And it was a sinking one and a trout color. And yeah, yeah, Zach, it was the hat, right? <laughs> And uh, yeah, the, the Smith Optics. Everyone's been giving me a hard time about the Smith Optics because it looks like I thought I'm you were to... snowboarding when I saw those. Yeah, I'm about to go snowboarding. snowboarding. Yeah. <laughs> so, but those are really cool. Those are the pursuits from Smith, and they're amber lenses. And but the fact that they're kind of full face like that, they just I can see in my peripheral. I don't have any any lens, any part of the um yeah. frame blocking me at all, no matter where I look. And it brightens it up, and it makes it look like it's sunny, and it brightens it up and helps you see in the water better. And that was important, not so much for the structure to catch a fish on more important for me to be able to see the depth of the water when I'm making my run way up, you know, the river, cause the water levels are getting lower every day and I have to stay floating, you know, per Bassmaster rules, you got to float in, float out. You got to be deep yeah. enough. You can re you can try again if you don't make it, but you gotta, you gotta be able to do it. So it, it was good to have those shades on. Cause I could see that the deepest water and knew where to go for those runs. But, um, I go, yeah. So, so I go up, upstream. I only have two fish and I'm slinging the spinner bait. Just, why not? It's not the greatest water I'm fishing. And I know it's not didn't catch them there pre-fishing and, uh, but I'm slinging it anyway. Cause you know, why not? Sometimes you're running pretty fast, but it doesn't hurt to make some casts. Right. And just no. burn it real quick. Um, and I caught two spot of bass, like a two, they were exactly 14 and a half inches both. So I got four, I'm close to a limit. And, uh, I know with that 22, if I can just get a decent limit, I'm on the stage. And that's really the goal. I think from anyone yeah. that fish, fish the Bassmaster, uh, kayak series championship is just to be on that classic stage. That's really all you want. I mean, winning is obviously, you know, just icing on the cake if you happen to end up in that spot, but you just want to get on that stage. So I know if I get one more good fish, I'm going to be on that stage. And um, so I ended up hooking because I caught those fish, I ended up still fishing the spinner bait a little bit more into some areas that and focusing a little bit more time than I thought I would thinking maybe they're repositioning as the water levels have continued to fall and the temps have continued to rise. Maybe they're repositioning for me. And I hook a like 19 ish, uh, smallmouth. and I'm fighting this thing about 30 seconds and, and it jumps. And when it jumps one time real high in the air, the spinnerbait just comes flying out of its mouth. So having a little PTSD about losing those big fish on chick last year at the championship, the same event. I know that fish would have put me on the stage probably didn't, you know, not have won it, but it would have gotten me real close, right. Uh, to having a chance, uh, because there's still some, you know, a few hours left two two and a half, three hours left in the event. And I just got to knock off a couple 14 and a half inches. Right. So if I would hook that fish, it was huge, but I still didn't have five. I had four and I just was like, Hey, God's going to show me something, uh, from this. And I need to take the positive from it. And the only positive I could take was the fact that I, I know now, that the big smallmouth hat, some of them are obviously repositioning on some of the stuff that was a little too swift in my pre-fishing days as the water crested from a recent rain in that, in that section of river. And now it's come down. It was too swift and they were not there. I promise you, they were not that on that kind of stuff in pre-fishing. So you got to fish the moment every day and every fish catch or fish loss in this particular instance will teach you something. And because of that, I, I saw some logs that had some slower, a little bit deeper water and some slower current on it. I pick up that Zal Dangerous swim bait in the back of my 
you know, in the tank well, that Sholey tied on, never caught a fish on it. The only pattern they had was a trout pattern in slow in the, in the fast sink. And I wanted the fast sink version. So trout pattern, I throw it by this, this log parallel of the log, about three cranks in just get hammered. And it's this 21 and a quarter inch smallie that I will bring on the screen right now. We can, um, uh, we can show that with, with the folks. I actually didn't have the camera running because I just, you know, I didn't believe this was, you know, this bite was happening, but this on this wood the, stuff yet. And I forgot to have the, the camera. Oh, running. no, that's not, sorry. That's the, the other one there. Oh. So in the middle of my fight, this is when this, I had the camera turned on. And my, my paddle drops off my uh, kayak and floats away. I mean, I'm a mess. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> beautiful chaos. Let's it call it. Exactly. The beautiful chaos of, of river fishing. Okay, come on, come on, car. And you look at this jump. When she jumps, I thought it was like seven pounds. It was probably almost six, but oh. just a monster. And uh, finally get her in here. This one's good. I mean, I got her on a big, the big stick with 30 pound braid and big hook. She's not going anywhere. I still kind of bellied her in. And you have a net for the love of God. <laughs> Yeah, but you just you don't really need nets for those big single hook baits when you set the hook right. They're just yeah, not coming true. off. You, you'll but, know uh, you set the hook. Yeah, and I've uh and I'll bring in the uh the clip of this that same fish from the front. You guys can get a little bit different. Uh while well, you get that, a question from um yeah. Andrew Watson, uh talking about braids. I've heard Drew mentions before he throws mainly straight braids. What braid brand of braids? I'm sorry, uh yeah. I lost the question. And, yeah, we're uh, are there ever, uh, and are there ever situations techniques that you don't go straight braid? I mean, so this is a good question because uh, in that video is cute. Whenever you do want to show up we, in a minute, maybe after this question, but that's a really good question because you got to think about it. I only look for places that fit the style that I want to fish. So stained water, backwaters, moving water, skinny water. And I only throw baits that you don't, you don't need to, to tie anything else on the straight braid. You don't, I mean, especially in a kayak when there's no, you can't crow hop step back. You know what I mean? And lay into them like you can on the deck of a bass boat or on the bank. You can't take two and three steps back and just hammer them and let all that stretch just, yeah. you know, get all out and then get, drive the hook in. I'm trying to drive the hook. Every hook set I make and every fish I hook, I'm hoping it's a, a giant like this. And therefore I need that amount of just force. There's no, stretch and braid and, and a kayak moves and as you're moving forward in a kayak you're creating slack and a kayak even no. on its own if you weren't even creating any slack when you set the hook you start going to the fish you can't get the same penetration so when i say like when they hit on that braid and it, straight braid and, and again it's all baits that you just don't need any other kind of like line like it's it's your spinner bait your chatter bait your your buzz baits your top water chapo and walking baits it's swim baits jigs man you just don't need you don't need any other line when it comes to if you're fishing the places i'm talking about fishing with the moving water situation yeah. and they're a little bit tend to be more aggressive the stained water or just in general top water baits you can throw 50 pound test doesn't matter swim baits doesn't matter it's a rig just giant line they don't care because it's just the way those baits trigger the bites and, and the way they're looking at it, usually from up, they don't see the line. The only thing you could make a case for is the jig in clear water or that gobius. But in practice, I always try to catch them. The, the more links you have in your chain, the more likely something yeah. can fail, right? So if I can go straight braid, and that's why I chose eight pounds SX1 Sunline on that gobius with that, that spinning rod. I went out there and pre-fishing to that exact area. And I've got some, some pictures of some fish I caught there with that exact setup, eight pound test to see if they would eat it in that clear water. Or if I needed to go get a fluorocarbon leader and do that whole stuff that I, I don't like to do. And they ate it just fine. They didn't care. So once I knew that on tournament day, I stuck with the same thing. And then same with the, you know, the jig and crawl, a jigs on the bottom. It's slower. They might could assess it and be like, Oh, what is I just don't think when you're throwing that down in a blowdown like that with all the other stuff and sticks going on, they just don't, they just don't seem to care. I mean, that's why I just tie straight braid and, and I, but I did when I won grand Lake, I was using, I was using um, fluoro because I just wanted to be sure. And I had two rods, like two of them spooled up on my kayak that had 16 pound sniper or shooter. I can't remember which one sunline fluorocarbon. And I had them on there just, just in case I thought, I did need the fluoro and need and if the braid was being a, a problem, but I never used them. Didn't need to and prefer never to try never yeah. to. That's a good question. 
Yeah, and to add to that, Andrew, if you're still watching, I would say if you're throwing big swim baits, do not use braid. The reason for it is if you get if you get a bird's nest and that thing is gonna <laughs> fly a country mile and you'll never get it back. So, um, big <laughs> I mean, swim I baits, like, I would. Well, I've tr yeah, you know, yeah. if you snap that line, on, it, it has like you said, it has yeah. no gifts. You get a bird's nest on a on a braid and yeah. you have a big swim bait and that thing or, is flying off and you'll never yeah. see it again. Just That's the sure only time I would use flutter. Yeah. yeah. Right. Just make sure you're real. You know how to cast it with that, with yeah. that braid and everything. I mean, you get longer cast with braid than any other line. Yes, so that's, that's why true. I'm like, if you can cast it with braid and you're not backlashing and things like that, it's the way to go for me. Yeah. But if it's, but like you're saying, you know, it, if you are, then then the floor might be a, another option for sure. So it doesn't have as yeah. much stretch as mono, so it's definitely a better choice than mono. Yeah, which is just a rubber band. So, but, and yeah, also, uh, mm -hmm. super new F seventy one says, Drew, can we get casting? Cry, I'm sorry, Crescent kayaks up here in Canada. They don't have them in Canada. You're not selling Canada yet. You know, I thought there was something up there. You can go to crescentkayaks.com, check out the dealer locator. There, I thought there was something. I know folks in Canada, River Smalley's On has Crescent Kayaks. And he's you go follow River Smalley's On on Instagram. Catches giants out of yeah. Sholey, out of all other Crescent models too. But um, yeah, the, he got them from somewhere. So it'd be interesting to see where he got those. It's got to be a place in Canada that sells them. Uh, so, I mean, you would think because the the, be the right. owner James Durbecker, he's from Canada, uh, or part of his family is. And they still have a cabin up there and everything. So definitely some Canadian ties with with Crescent and Canada. Some Canadian DNA in that Crescent show, yeah, or Crescent yeah, brand, sure. should say. Yeah, but yeah, the, right. the videos there. Whenever you're ready, we can show the front angle of that fish. And oh yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, we didn't show it's, that. It's this was up. your last fish. This was your, was you know, the eventually you were killing shit. Not, not the very last one, that, but this was the one that you know obviously had a 22 and now it's 21 and a quarter small it was nearly six pounds and uh that sort of kind of sealed it pretty much i didn't know that at the time obviously you never you just... oh god stop get in the boat yes oh my god what just happened what just happened that's on super view there on the front you can oh see how kind of Fish eye, but yeah, that was cool, man. Just I was freaking out, you know. I bet. But uh <laughs> yeah, I was oh, definitely it's so freaking funny. Out. So funny that you have a net, but you still like to live <laughs> dangerously. I well, I've say. just lost as many fish trying to net them. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's gotta, true. I really Russ have Snyder. I've I've talked to Ross yeah. Snyder. I think he never uses a net. And Russ Snyder is kind of like along with you, you know, yeah, so much success. I mean, I've just you can argue it both ways. I really have seen it where you're reaching back, you're fiddling around yeah. and trying to get it. And I know you could, the Crescent show is nice because it does have those yak attack kind of taco style yeah. rod holders right there. And I can you, just the compression. You don't need to bunch them down. You, it actually fits your net really easy. So it's there easily for me to grab it and pull it out. But the, the thing is, have you ever like tried to net a fish and you go to the edge and you swipe and they, they move away and the yeah. bait actually gets caught in the net and you knock the bait out of their mouth or, you know, there's just lots of other things you're trying to do and you're not fighting them the same way. Or, you know, I don't know. I've just seen as many fish. Sometimes you hit them with the net and they go lost. crazy when say they see the net for some yeah, reasons. You great. might have one that is kind of tired out and you're like, okay, well, instead of lipping them, I'll just bring them. Like I had it where I had like big bass, right? Um, yeah. And, and I figured I can lip them, but they're so big. Then I mean, it was like a 22 incher. And as nice. soon as I, I was like, you know what, let, let me just grab the net just so I won't feel like I'm harming them or something. And as soon as they see the net, they get another burst of energy. Something about that net that yeah. just drives them crazy. Like they don't want it. It's they true. don't, they don't want to come close to it. And they'll, they'll give you an extra push versus if you lip them, they might just yep. let you lip them. That's right. But once they see that net on the water, they just go crazy. For yeah, some they reason. do. But anyway, that I caught one other fish that was 16 and three quarters that actually got rid of one of those 14 and a half inch little spots. And that actually ended up being the difference, a, a large yeah. mouth upstream on a, on a spinner bait on some wood. And then I just was swimming that big swim bait for another, like, you know, hour and a half in the tournament thinking I'm going to get hammered. I'm, I'm up at that spot where that 19 and a half inch small. was caught on day one. I know the big ones live up there in a, a couple of these areas that, that I had and saw big ones. And dude, I got hit one time and there was some heavy weight. And then it was just off. And so I, in my mind, when I left the, the river that day, I said, 
I've lost it. I lost it. I didn't know what the standings were. I wasn't looking at them. Um, even though. Oh, I so you never, you yeah, never I saw didn't. Guillermo Gonzalez behind you because that would make anybody nervous. I didn't it, but, well <laughs> after I got off the water. Once it was over, I did, and it did make me nervous. Once I got off the water, I did see a screenshot that some friends uh, from the kayak anglers of Northeast Ohio, I think Eric uh, Orpatan, he sent me a screenshot of the leaderboard before it went off. And I was in the lead by like three inches or something. Three and a half, I three think. And, half. Over Guillermo. and he, and he, you know, and I'm like, and you, yeah, that's never a safe lead. It's not Guillermo. safe with Guillermo. Just ask Jody so Quinn. Good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the Trinity. <laughs> yeah. that He's a hammer, man. He's one of the best. And if, you know, so I was nervous about that. Also nervous about other anglers. Maybe they weren't posting during the day. You know, you don't yeah. have to. Maybe you didn't have signal. I mean, there's lots of things that happen. Maybe they just cold up in the last hour, caught two or three big fish. You just don't know. And I was nervous because uh, the main reason I was nervous was, yes, it was the, the potential of the other anglers, but it was really more about, you guys know what this is. If you fish tournaments, it's more like the, between me and the fish. Okay, they got me that day. I mean, I got 90 and a half inches, so I got them, you could say for sure. But I feel like they got me. Think about it. I lost three fish that were definitely going to be most likely – over 16 inches. I never caught anything under 16 in that slough. And the one that pulled me under the log and the spinnerbait was, it felt big. So that's three that would have gotten rid of that 14 and a half inch spot. Then I lost the 19 plus like kind of 19 ish range smallmouth on the, when it jumped into the spinnerbait. Then I lost a giant that thumped that swim bait and I felt the weight and I don't catch that one. I'm thinking, dude, I should have had like upper nineties right now instead of got 90 and a half, which is incredible. And I predicted it would take 90 inches for two days to win this event. So I was apparently right on the money on that. But I still think those fish are going to cost me. You know, that's just the mindset of you, you always want more as an as an angler, especially when you had the bites, you know. So I'm thinking Guillermo or somebody caught him. And I kind of got wind that maybe he didn't. So then I was a little bit optimistic. But we saw what happened to with Brady Stores and, and Jordan Marshall at the TOC last year. Everybody mm -hmm. thought Jordan had it. All the doc talk around the, the TOC at the results was Jordan, Jordan won, you know, he's going to finally get one of those. I know he'd been trying and uh, cause he'd been second a couple times before and it was Brady. Brady's over in the corner being quiet and yeah. hammer, just hammered him. So you don't know, man, until they call your name. So I actually yeah. had to sleep on 24 hours. I had to sleep on that until we were on the big stage uh, the next day on the, the classic stage. So, but um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. But uh, one thing I, I will say and it probably will segue us into another topic if you want to hit it still, yep. is it's very important, guys. I feel like if you want to fish the way I fish and the style that I, I enjoy and why I got into kayak fishing, these backwaters and rivers and creeks, I would just say that GoPro is the biggest thing you could do is invest in a good GoPro setup yep. because it will save your butt, save my butt on Pickwick, you know, Bassmaster Pickwick in 2022 when I had all the footage showing how I got you know, around and under and all the, the you know, the, the logs and stuff like that and the skinny water and up the skinny you know, riffles and stuff. I had it all running the whole time showing how I stayed in my kayak, you know, wasn't easy, worked my butt off. I, I, I had my setup dialed in just like I did on this event. And, and you know, it's no different than someone working hard, dialing in their electronics and the angle of their transducer and a harness and the battery to make sure they can see it bright and clear on their screen and just dialing all that in is it's it's cool that a bass lives deep lives shallow lives muddy clear water rocks logs vegetation whatever they live everywhere and it's so cool that we all have different personalities and we get to impart our personalities and our style into how we catch those fish so it's really cool i would invest in a gopro um yeah. i told steve owens before the event he said thumbs up thumbs down how's it going practice thumbs up you looking positive and i said yeah, like kind of like nervous, like up. And I said, Steve, I'm going up the river. Same thing I told uh, Dwayne Wally that it was the tournament director for Pickwick that year. Uh, before the tournament on Friday, I said, Dwayne, here's where I'm at. Right here. I share, you know, I'm going way up this creek and I've cleared it in pre-fishing. I know it's all clear. I can do it in my setup. And also um, I shared my location with Mark Cisneros, the cameraman for, for Bassmaster and Casey can get off the water of his boat never go see me somewhere to you know just follow me if i'm getting close to a bridge or some public place he can get a picture uh which is just challenging for him i know but uh, i told him at this event where i was as well in case he wanted to see me but i feel like we have an extra bur burden of proof and responsibility when you fish this yeah. way you know what i mean obviously you know we're, we're not portaging over into some farm pond and stuff but it's you need people need to see how you do it and mm -hmm. not 
the public doesn't always have to see it, but you need to have it to show the tournament directors. I love for the public to see it so they can, you know, it promotes the series, promotes what I do and, and the kayaks and all the sponsors and stuff. It's, it's good. So invest in a GoPro, have it running the entire time. So nobody can ever question this stuff or it can get you out of some, some trouble if yeah. someone questions it. And that's a cool part of the sport that you can protest if you need to. It ensures the validity of all these events. If you don't have that, you know, then how do we know people what they're doing, you know? So that having the fish catches and, and stuff is, is critical. And, you know, just, just invest in that GoPro and run it nonstop. Yeah. Some don't use the looping mode. Don't loop it. Run that one behind you nonstop. So it doesn't loop. Uh, that way you have everything, you know? So. No, I agree with that. That's a little tip. That segues into something we, we and I talked about on the pre-recording about, you know, this obviously is the big win for you. I'm sure it's the biggest win in your career, but it, I would imagine, and you tell me, because I think it m would mean a lot more after you, you what you went through in at the end of 2022 in Pickwick and the AOI. Now, full disclosure, you know this because mm -hmm. we and I talked. I made a podcast about it after talking to a lot of people. I didn't necessarily, and it's just a question of semantic. Like I said, I didn't think you you cheated at all, but I also right. didn't agree with some of the stuff. Uh, but that's neither here or there. Right. The reality is you had to go through um, a, a um, how do you say this? Like uh, panel. Yeah, panel like you had to go to a panel. You, uh, but the stigma of like, you know, you kind of got, I don't know if disqualified right. is just kind of like disqualified yeah, until you just until you got reinstated, yeah. which I'm happy for you. And again, we yeah. might be just a question of semantics. Um, but um, regardless, what right. you went through in all the stigma and the court of public opinions, even after you got reinstated, does this right. not, you know, you didn't cheat. You don't need to right. vindicate yourself to anybody. But sure. I guess vindicated is it's the word, maybe yeah, not I mean, the right word, but how do you feel as far as right. you want this? You feel vindicated? Do you feel like, like, gives it yeah. a little bit more of a, of a personal touch that you want this event because right, of what right. Doing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, first of all, if you want to fish in the big leagues and kayak fishing or bass boat world, you better be able to handle some stuff. I mean, it's just the truth of the matter is you better learn how to talk on stage and be in front of a bunch of people and go on podcasts like this and represent, you know, whoever you represent, your family, your sponsors, whoever. Well, it's not easy. I mean, look at Christine Fisher. She does an incredible job given all the pressure and all the eyeballs that are on her I mean, Guillermo obviously is right there. Russ, I mean, Jody, you're Jody Queens. Uh, there's just so many people out there that do such a good job for our sport, and it's not easy. So if you want to, you know, come to the big leagues, you better be prepared to handle situations like this, which is why I said film it. Just film it all. Then what is anyone going to say? You know, you can yeah. show it to the uh, tournament directors. So, but in terms of like, yeah, the rules, some rules were changed and stuff, and people always joke around and say, oh, those are the Gregory rules and stuff like that. Did, did that which, ever bother you? I know, um, I know. Chad Hoover was went live on his podcast. You know when the rule changes came. Oh yeah, yeah. And he mentioned like, well, the Drew Gregory rules, which right. I was like, well, it's one thing for one person to say; it's one thing for a tournament director of his stature to say it on a live show. Yeah. Did that ever bother you that you were coined? Not necessarily just That's him saying question. it, but but there was coined yeah. as the Drew Gregory rules. Well, there's two parts of that. One. It's actually there is a compliment side to it because Roland Martin and Ott Defoe and yeah. a lot of a lot of your best, most renowned pros in the sport have a little bit of out of the box thinking sometimes to do things that are within the rules. Now it's one thing if if they're if you do it within the rules, like next year if they say you can only have two graphs on your bass boat or three graphs max, and and people won with five and six. It doesn't change that that guy did everything within the rules at that time. Mm. So it shouldn't discredit any of his wins just because he had five graphs on and now we allow three, right? Yeah, yeah. So there's some out of the box thinking that, you know, definitely will help you in, in sports like this. And just like, I know there's, so there's that side of it. That's a little bit of a compliment. I get that. And that's cool. There's the other side that, you know, the rule change actually wasn't, you know, I stayed in my kayak. That's always been a part of Bassmaster and Hope. Yeah. You've got to stay in your kayak. You can't get out. You can't portage. And I did that. And the rule, that part of the rule, did, well, it changed a little bit. You can't, you know, once you're, you're it got kayak, redefined. It got, it got redefined. Was, yeah. Once your kayak hits the bottom, you can't go any further. You got to be floating, you know. So it changed a little bit there. But designated launches, that, I mean, people calling that Gregory rule, it would be a little bit off because 
I mean, I've never launched from anywhere that wasn't public and, and legal, you know, and all the terms designated go, launches yeah, right yeah. where it was. And yeah, mm-hmm. now there's designated launches. So was that a Gregory rule? Well, if it, that kind of insinuates that Gregory was launching somewhere that wasn't legal. No. So now we got to make this a rule, which really doesn't even, it's kind of, we can get it the whole you know rabbit hole in this or whatever kind of semantics rabbit tail because yeah. because no one's checking us in at our launches anyway so who's to say right now people aren't launching wherever in the world they feel like launching private yeah. public places that aren't on the designated list we don't know so and, and i never have heard of anyone and i certainly haven't anyone who was launching at places that weren't legal before they changed that rule but they changed the rule for a reason and that's not even for me to worry about or they don't have to tell me or or justify it to me or explain to me why or you know i don't know and that's it's not really my concern that's you know bassmaster has reasons and hobie and they all have their reasons and that's fine you know i'm going to play by the rules whatever they are and so um i'm still going to fish my style and it definitely is harder to fish and get to the places that i got into kayak fishing for no doubt uh you got to have that torpedo now you you know before you could get away with putting it at a bridge and floating yeah. down and doing stuff like that at access points at canoe and kayak launches and now you can't really uh, in these events. And so it changes the way I fish a little bit, but, and there's a little bit less water of my style that I prefer. And if they, for some reason ever were to change the rules where I couldn't fish that kind of water, um, I would just stop tournament fishing. Cause I got into this sport, you know, kayak fishing this pastime, not even a sport back then. It was just a pastime. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I haven't been fishing tournaments for like four, what, four years, five years. So I got into it to fish wild places because I love rivers and creeks and backwaters and places that boats can't get. And if I ever uh, have said this, you know, in other podcasts, if it ever gets to the point where I can't fish the way I love and the places I love and why yeah, I, I got into that. kayak fishing, I'm out of the tournament scene. I just won't do it. If I'm stuck in the oh, same was on water, the Alex Rudd podcast, you said boats, that. Yeah. yeah, I'll be out of that. So probably was on Alex Rudd. Um, I've said it on many. So to me, uh, I just – you know, it was a little bit of a compliment on one side. The other side, it was, I hope people aren't thinking because they're saying, oh, designated launches or a Gregory rule that that all of a sudden, you know, questioning like, was this guy, he was launching places that weren't legal. So now he's why we have to have designated launches. I mean, I got some some hate from some people and some email, some messages that like, like, thanks a lot, man. They were like, dude, we're so, they were pissed at me. Like, thanks to you, we can't freaking kayak fish anymore. We can't launch at places that kayaks were meant to launch at and meant to fish those waters. And now we're stuck with these designated launches. I'm like, bro, go talk to the tournament director. I've never launched anywhere that wasn't public whatsoever. Yeah. And I've told the, you know, I've checked in them on the app. They know right where I launch. It's all legal. I know how to do my research on uh, the far wide app and finding what's, what's public and what's not and, and right of ways and stuff like that. So, and then they realize, Oh, I'm sorry. I thought everyone was saying it was Gregory launches. It was because of you launching somewhere that was not legal that they changed the rule. And that's just not true. So on that side, I don't like that that term, but it is what it is. Like I said, you got to be willing to take some criticism, some heat. If you want to uh, kind of play in the big leagues and that's just part of you it. Gotta, so. You got to have to have broad shoulders when you're on the top. That's yeah. as the saying goes. Yeah. So does and, it feel, and, so does yeah, it feel vindicated. <laughs> more vindicated or more yeah. sweet? Yeah, it kind of, I mean, it really does, you know, but because I, I just wonder if some people were like, Oh, well, he's only good because he just, puts in way far away somewhere and find something that, that, I mean, anybody else could have found and anybody else could have done. And, and I mean, Pickwick was the top 10 in Pickwick the year before, just, I don't know if people know this. I think I mentioned it before in some podcasts, but the top 10, the year before I won Pickwick that way, two of the top 10 were in the exact same Creek I was in and no one has a problem with it. All of a sudden you win, but all of a sudden you win and you're somewhere like that. All it's an issue. You see what I'm saying? So there was never an issue until uh, there was winning fish that all of a sudden came from there. But anyway, I felt a little bit uh, more just like I kind of maybe I've to some people, maybe I've got to prove myself of, again a little bit like, hey, I can catch them wherever. And really, this tournament win wasn't the vindication of that. And I don't let that kind of rule my life. But what it was, honestly, in my opinion, Armando, it was 2023, the year after, you know, the first year, of those new rules. I finished fourth in AOI and Bassmaster. And I finished first the year before that with the rules. And I finished fourth. I mean, is that much different? You know what I mean? Like fourth and first. I mean, I'm way up there at the top of AOI. I finished one Hobie event and got second place. And, you know, I mean, that's Me, darn good finishes, even with all the new rules, right? So Dan and I were talking about it on an episode we recorded on his segment of the mm-hmm. podcast, Advanced Cack Anglers, which, by the way, is, airs every Wednesday. If you want to, if for those out there listening, we talk about Dan and Kurt talk about techniques. And um, 
more like a teaching aspect. This is more of a conversation with right. tournament anglers and uh, content creators and anybody involved in bass fishing. But we were talking about this. It's like, man, for Drew Gregory standard, it seems like an off season, like a not a great season. But that's because we're used to your greatness. Like, like we didn't see. Like, I don't think twenty twenty three you won a tournament. You I were, never won one, but I was. What, yeah, I was well, second, well, yeah, and I was four. And I was like, AOI. I was funny, but it's like, yeah, anyone. 90% of the kayak fishing community would kill to have a Drew Gregory bad season, if you want to coin it that. Because right, your right. your bad season is better than 90% of people's regular uh, season. Um, right. But we were mentioning on the podcast, it's like he may not be having the, you know, the wins that we're used to seeing, which is like two or three a year, mm -hmm. but he's going to figure it out. Like, yeah, yes, yeah. maybe, maybe this rules kind of affect him in a little way, like you mentioned, but it's only mm -hmm. a matter of time be due between when, until Drew figures right. it out. And once he figures it out, he's going to get back to being a good old Drew, which is winning two or three tournaments yeah. a year, yeah. probably. Do right. you feel like that's, do you feel like it was an adjustment? And are you, this, this, this win make mm -hmm. you feel like you're past that adjustment or this is just a more of a lake by lake situation? Uh, You know, I don't, Honestly, it's more of just a fish by fish situation. I mean, I had the two fish on to win the Bassmaster Championship last year. Like I said, I was sharing water with Russ. Had the two giants on, I, I win. You know, look how different you look about my look at my year last year. If I have a Bassmaster Championship win combined with a fourth place AOI, you're like, dang, dude. Okay, you didn't win two or three or multiple times. But I also don't. People don't. I don't. Maybe they don't realize this. I don't fish that many tournaments. Like last year, yeah. I didn't fish that many. I'm not. You know, I'm working designing boats with, with Crest and I'm working on a bait company uh, behind the scenes. I've been dealing with uh, lots of other stuff going on and family, the kids, the dog. I don't have yeah, 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 families events. getting bigger. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 other people, you only remember, like, it seems like you really remember the wins yeah. and the top finishes. And so this is actually encouraging and hopefully should be positive people. When you have a bad event, no one re like remembers that. Like, trust me, no one even realizes that you were way down there, but. You, they remember they, they they'll probably come up to you and say, dude, you're crushing it this year. Cause you had like two top fives or what, you know, whatever. And you're like, I don't know. And you're thinking about all the, the six or seven other events that they weren't good, yeah. but they just remember the good. So don't feel so down. It's a, it's a tough sport for sure. So I would just say it was a lot closer last year than people realize, but winning in an individual sport is hard. And maybe there were some adjustments with that learning the tor torpedo, you know, um, I didn't, I, I, don't think I cast a check. I was close, but didn't at the very first KBF. I did fish in Kissimmee last year. Didn't do that great on Murray right after that. I, I mean, I did again, like you said, like you said, it's for my standards. It's not great when you're like 15th or 17th or something, whatever, not, you know, winning or whatever, but, uh, or, or cashing a check, but didn't have the, the best events there. Um, but then, you know, lacrosse was like six or seventh, you know, right behind De Palma, I think. And then, the new river did good and then did good at, um, didn't do good at possum kingdom. Possum kingdom kicked my butt last year for sure. I was like down to the fifties or something. Uh, but then there was another bat, a bass master I did really good at 50. I think it was 15th out of 250 on Gunnersville. I mean, 15th isn't that great when you think say just 15th and you're thinking hundred people, but out of 250. So your AY points aren't that great, even though really your, your finish was excellent. 15th out of that's better than the top 10%. Yeah. And, uh, so I had some good, good finishes, uh, you know, that were closer than people realize, but it just takes a fish or two here to kind of change everyone's mindset about what happened. And then the, at the end fishing like the minimum number of events again for the Bassmaster AOI, I'm pretty sure I did. Maybe I did one over, but either way it was fourth in AOI. So good season wins are just tough to have tough to come by, man. They are. So this is for you. Again. They are. <laughs> Yeah, but it, it could stop. If, we, could if stop. I don't, if I close yeah. my eyes and I don't look at the wall and the trophies, I would believe you. For you, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, for the rest of us, it's it, tough to win. <laughs> to get like wins, five but. tournaments this year. You know what I mean? The odds of me winning uh, like are not that great out of five tournaments, but. Obviously, I won this first one of fish this year, so now I don't care what happens the rest of the year, man. I'm excited. Yeah, no, you can suck for the rest of the year. It's still you know, an amazing year. There's not, there's nothing personal, vindication, all that. It just feels like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders, but it certainly felt good for anyone maybe who still, I mean, I don't know how anyone out there still like maybe would ever doubt that I know how to catch fish or whatever. You, you listen to someone talk on podcasts and you can typically tell if that angler actually is legit or not just by when yeah. – 
they talk about how they caught him and what they did and their strategy. So I don't think anyone's ever listened or to, you know, me talk about fishing and, and been like, I don't know, that guy doesn't have a clue, you know? So, no, I, but if there is, if, if there were a few people out there that still were questioning whether my intent and, and obviously it, it's, it, everyone's capable of uh, accidentally breaking a rule unintentionally, you know, that could happen. Yeah. It happens to Bassmaster guys all the time. There's a big, big difference. It has happened to everyone. Accidentally breaking a rule. Jody Queen forgot to put the life jacket Christine on. Christine Fisher. Christine, um, yep. Uh, Gene Jensen, but the flu master, happened to him. Uh, Russ Snyder, time. Jordan Marshall. And it's huge. all accidental, yeah. All she, There's a huge difference in that and having fish in a basket. You know what I mean? Over yeah. there intentionally or having a cut fishtail. And I think everyone I think that knows me knew that at that event, if I broke a rule, it was unintentional, you know, and I wanted to make sure and I wanted to, to, to just make sure that I, I uh, show what I showed. And if I did and they deemed that I did, then so be it. It certainly wasn't intentional. But if there are any, if there was anybody out there that still questioned, you know, how I catch these fish or if I've ever cheated or whatever, I, I hope that's kind of like put to bed now. I hope this kind of will like just end all that because I want to continue to spread positivity and love, you know, and passion for the sport and for others with my platform as opposed to negativity, which we are seeing a lot of in the bass fishing world these days. So yeah. let's just kind of to take it back. And that kayak adventure series is a big part in that bringing those events to people and letting them, you know, letting a lot of folks kayak fish the way that they, they may have got a kayak like I did with to just dump in at any public access point. We got lakes and bounds. we got rivers and bounds, just six events. Uh, it's real low key. It's fun, you know, good for beginners and intermediates to kind of build their way up to these elite level events and you get a chance to be on a stage at the theater and get, get a little practice in front of for people. And, and hopefully we lighten the mood showing some videos behind us and you got some good fish catches and bring your whole family. There's a kid zone, bouncy houses, Toyota truck demos, kayak demos, lots of just other stuff going on. That's, that's fun. And we got seminars from pros on Friday mornings, our Bass university brunch, Bass U brunch, just a whole weekend of just fun activities yeah. and fellowship. And we end on Saturday so we can go party Saturday night and just celebrate late into the night and uh, sleep it off on, on Sunday if we're out too late. And just the camaraderie, that's, that's what it's all about. And uh, you know, it, it's tough to have the last thing I think we were going to mention, it is tough to have, uh, you know, the elite level series, like your, you know, your Hobies and your bass masters, they're getting to where there's so much money involved and, and it's like the elites and, and bass master on the bass boat side. Yeah. It's hard to, you can't be both. You know what I mean? The kayak adventure series is not some elite level. I know that some really good anglers, you know, Russ and Jody and Abby, Abandanza and Christine, even some, definitely some good sticks are going to come fish one or two, but they're focusing on this stuff. You know what I mean? That for their, and that, and that to them is fun. It's fun to me fishing this stuff, but for other people, it's not, and they got to start somewhere. So and, and learn how to travel nationally and, and try to catch fish in, in different species and different locations. So it's a good chance to come rub elbows with them and, and kind of get your feet wet on kind of a national stage and uh, win a bunch of stuff and, and just have a good time. And because the fellowship Bassmaster does a good job with a meet and greet on Thursday, a little fun fellowship thing that Steve Owens has, has got going. It's awesome. Um, and, but you know, you can't be both, you know what I mean? You really can't be both. And they've got to stay focused to their, what, what they're about. And, and the anglers there, I mean, when I'm at those events, I'm not thinking about, let me go out with the, hang out late in the night and, and drink and yeah. party and let's have fun. I, I'm just like rigging, rigging, getting sleep as fast as I can. And that's, that's kind of, you don't see the elites doing that. You don't see any PGA tour players who are doing it for a living, staying out till one and two in the morning when they got a six thirty tea time. It's just, you can't be both. And so this is good. Cause it kind of fills a, a void in kayak fishing. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's hard court volleyball and there's sand volleyball. There's, there's paved track racing, you know, NASCAR racing, and there's dirt racing. It's good for the bass boat world to be complemented by kayak and even kayak to have some, some differences in there. Cause it's all kind of, you know, just appeals to different folks and their personalities and their styles. So we'll see how that, that kind of helps, you know, I guess hopefully grow the sport and, and get more people into it. And then they can branch off and still fish a full season of whatever they want. Hobie. Yeah. ABF Bassmaster. Right. I agree with you. It fills a void because it's not, you know, when you fish tournaments, have, I mean, it's kind of eye-opening, Hobie, BOS, and Bass Masters. Mm -hmm. I love it. it it's this, what I love doing, competing. But it is business-like atmosphere. Like, unless you have your group of friends that you're going with, you know, then maybe you have your fun and all that. But for the most part, if you're going solo with just two or three yeah. anglers that are looking to compete and 
uh, qualify right. for championships and AOI. It's just business. It's just yeah. pre fishing is fish 10 hours, eat something, business. rig up for next day, and go That's to right. sleep. That's it. it. There's there's no hanging out or yeah, it's, you know, they're doing, doing it for a living, stuff. man. They're doing we're yeah. doing it for a living. A lot of people are now. It's not like a ton, but there there's enough to where they're doing it for a living. So if you think you're gonna ever go in there and take take their money and and win, you better be focused as as, as much as you can, as close to the intensity game, yeah. that they are. So yeah, man, it's it's crazy. But yeah. One last question before I let you, you know, plug in uh your sponsors and your kayak adventure series. Anthony Watson fishing says, looking forward to to it. I'm assuming he's talking about the um kayak adventure series. Are any of the kayaks going to be for sale? Time for will, a new ride. Yeah. yeah, so we'll have dealers at the events doing kayak demos. Now, the first event is called Sholy Palooza, May 3rd and 4th in Georgia. And that particular one, we'll have kayak demos at the opening ceremonies on Thursday, not the Saturday festival, because our opening ceremonies is actually at a place called Spreewell Bluff Park, right on the river. And downtown where our theater is and the awards and all that, there's not a water source close enough to have kayak demos. So, But they will have... Two of the dealers will be there. Actually, maybe even three, but two of them will be there. Uh, Southern Boutique Outfitters and Westbrook Supply Company. So they'll have kayaks there, and I'm sure they will be happy to send them in the back of your truck <laughs> from that event as well. They'll have some to, to sell. So, Or you could just pick them up. Southern Boutique is south and um, Westbrook Supply is north. And they've got kayaks from all of the, the sponsors of the series. We've got Crescent Kayaks, obviously, New Canoe. you got Feel Free Kayaks. you got Bonafide and Old Town. All five of those brands are sponsors of the series. You know, we're trying to just be super inclusive of lots of brands, lots of anglers and their styles and how they fish. And it's cool that those brands were all willing to, to come on board at each, at each event. We're donating. Well, not donating. We're raffling off. They've donated, but and we're raffling off one kayak from each of those manufacturers at each event. And it, the proceeds go to the punt foundation to raise money for pediatric cancer. So go straight to them. It's a good cause. So maybe you'll win a kayak at the kayak adventure series. You there know, you go. You know, so maybe you win. Actually, the first hundred anglers, just so everyone knows, I get signed up for Sholy Palooza now. In any event, they're all open because the first one hundred anglers get one hundred dollars in sponsors' products and a, a sponsors' product bag worth a hundred dollars of stuff. And the entry so fee for the individual, individual, yeah, individual division is only one hundred and fifty. There's a two man team division. There's a five smallest bass micro bag division. A lot of fun ways to uh, to win youth division, uh, top female presented by Women's Fishing Federation. Just a lot of fun stuff going on. Uh, trust me, if you go to the website kayakadventureseries.com, you'll be like, "Whoa, this is it's a lot happening." But um, but you can't lose. So come on in if you just want to join in the team division. It's seventy five bucks a person, one hundred and fifty per team. So it's not some big investment, you know, that you might you know have to have to do later on when you build your way up to fishing some of this bigger you know, higher stake stuff. So it'll be fun. Yeah, man. All right. So I've got you over an hour and 38 minutes. And and I mean, you've been more than kind to come up to the podcast. We crushed um, it, man. Thank so you. I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> uh, keep you on too long because I know you've had a lot of work and doing a lot of podcasts and YouTube videos and all that. So um, I want to take a few minutes to shout out your sponsors and then we'll, we'll leave it at that. If it's okay with you. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, honestly, it, it's just so hard for me to remember them all, but I definitely want to thank real tree fishing. You know, they support me as a headline sponsor, obviously X two batteries. You see here, Z man baits. I mean, I talk about all this stuff in the show. So it's like, you know, kind of organically already been mentioned, but, um, and I'm trying to think GoPro, you know, supporting me all these years. And, um, yeah, I'm trying to think anyone I really didn't cover in the show that the sunline AFCO sunline stuff was clutch the torpedo the innovative sportsman stuff that went with that torpedo the steering triangle the the rock guard i mean can't thank them enough for all the support um trey over there yak attack man that the yak attack stuff just all over the kayak you almost forget about it because so much of it comes on that crescent kayak surely and uh boondocks you know jeff little's now with boondocks so he's about to start yep. developing and crushing some cool new stuff for boondocks like he did with torpedo and they make some incredible products over there so go check them out um got that new gear tree i've been using that in my garage to store everything so it's been pretty cool but yeah i mean i think i mean i probably forgot people i know i have but that's okay you guys follow along at drew gregory fishing um dark horse tackle guys that's a good sponsor of the kayak adventure series and 
essentially you know, sponsor me as well. Uh, essentially it's kind of all blurred a little bit with the, how I've got lots of sponsors for the, the series uh, as well. But uh, you know, big, huge shout out to those guys as well. Dark horse and all they do. Um, and yeah, just appreciate our, all the support from everybody out there. Let's just keep spreading the love guys, spreading the love and the passion for the sport. And uh, who knows where we'll be in 15, 20, 30 years. If we just keep doing that. By the way, I do think I almost forgot. I do have to announce the winners, but I'll let you go. Yeah. Uh, Drew, because I don't want to keep you up too late, but uh, Good. I'll announce Thanks, the winners guys. for the giveaway. Uh, do congratulations. We look forward to what you have going on this year. Kayak adventure series. Um, hopefully it's coming to Texas next year at some point or near yeah, Texas. I, will, I would love to see I'll give you a little, little wink that there you go you know might ah, you might go. like you might like something coming next year 2025 schedule is done which brings up a good point i should shout out steve owens i know i mentioned him earlier incredible job at the, for running that bassmaster kayak series and that event incredible incredible job uh but he and i've been working together aj we kind of work chad on the schedules but my 2025 is done for kas dates locations contracts signed done nice and you guys will get it way sooner than has ever been done before in our sport which is pretty cool so you guys can start planning and uh we'll be we'll be closer than we were this year to i'll say that much closer than we were this year to texas and to you guys out there and there's some great fisheries so it'll be exciting so we'll see uh guess you have to wait and see <laughs> there you go. when do you plan to announce the dates after i'm assuming 2024 season is done um i've got a little sneaky plan on how we'll roll it out and it won't be long you guys it won't be too long and we'll, we'll announce right. it so i'm excited there's one that's not actually it's not there's one that's not done but all the rest are done there's one that i got to finalize but uh i got a little cool plan on how to do that every year for the dates so we we will well, see do i appreciate it. i'm trying to find the paper where i put the winners oh, yeah. but anyways i'll find it Drew, thank you so much. I'll let you go so you can go rest, and then I'll go ahead and announce the winners. Um, thank you so much, and again, looking forward to everything that's coming and success right, this year. Thanks, Hopefully bud. See you on the appreciate, water. Appreciate what you do in the sport, man. Keep it up. Thank you. See you. Right. Drew Gregory, everybody. Great, uh, great angler, great human being, um, great ambassador to the sport. All right, so let's get to the winners. God, I, dang it, I had the paper over here. I have to look at it on my phone. But anyways, like I mentioned, the giveaway is not going to be based on the live viewers. Uh, it's going to be based on the people that, like we announced on the giveaway, that left us a review on Apple Podcast. First of all, we're going to announce the winners for the – let me look it up here. I had it on my phone uh, since I lost the paper. The winner for the um, – first of all, we're going to announce the Dark Horse Tackle winner. So the Dark Horse Tackle winner is three-month subscription of Dark Horse Tackle. You don't have to pay anything. If you, after three months, you decided you don't want to do it, that's fine. You still get your three months. It's not like you have to sign up for one year and get the first three months and then have to pay the rest of you. It doesn't work like that. You're going to have three-month subscription. And that goes to Regina Jones. Regina, I'm on, as soon as I'm done here, I'm probably going to start heading up for Cattle Lake for a tournament. So I'll get a hold of you on Monday because uh, I'm going to be busy this weekend. But Regina Jones, if you're watching, you are the winner for the Dark Horse Tackle three-month subscription. $100 gift card from Mariner Sales goes to Jeremy McCormick. Jeremy, again, we'll, I'll reach out to you by Monday. Um, you are the $100 winner for the gift card for Mariner Sales. That's $100. You can use it online or in-store. And last but not least, um, Nick Myers is the winner of the Catch product. Nick, if you're watching, again, I'll reach out to you on Monday. I'll give you two options. We have two products that they sent us. So I'll let you re decide which one you want. It's going to be either a catch board or it's going to be, I think they call it the X, 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 X tracks, uh, which you can use. It comes two of them. I think one is 26 inches or 10 inches, something like that. The other one is like six inches. But anyways, I'll let you pick. I'll send you the pictures. So again, Nick Myers, you're the winner for the Catch Outdoors products. And again, thank you for watching and listening. If you listen on an MP3 format, uh, 
please remember if you listen on Apple Podcasts, you can uh, leave us a review and rate the show, and we would really appreciate it. Thank you to our sponsors, North Lithium Batteries, Douglas Outdoors, Great Rods, Dark Horse Tackle, and Catch Outdoors, and also our new partner, Mariner Sales here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. Thank you for tuning in and watching. I'll leave you with this and have a great night. And would please wear your PFDs if you're going to be out on the water. We'll catch you next week on the Advanced Kayak Angler on Wednesday and the live show on next Thursday. So that's it. Peace out, everyone. Have a great night.